Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Oh, very good. Follow the yellow brick road. Oh, I'm so hungry and tired. <gasps> Apples! <gasps> Why, a man! <laughs> a man made out of tin. Oil can. Oil can. Oil can. This? <laughs> Where would you like me to oil first? Mouth. Mouth. <laughs> oh, I can talk. It feels so good. Uh, elbows. Oh. Oh, wow. Oh, does that hurt? No, it's wonderful. I can move. <laughs> well, how did you get this way anyway? I was chopping wood and it, be, it started to rain. I rusted solid. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happened? <laughs> a year it's been. Time a man without a heart. Without a heart? No way. You can. You're perfect now, though. Perfect. You can tap on my chest and see. <laughs> see? <laughs> I'm a hollow. The tinsmith forgot to give me a heart. Well, I have an idea. Why don't you come with us to the Emerald City and you can ask the wizard for a heart? Yes, yes, yes. Yes? But what if he doesn't give me a heart? Oh, he will. He must. We've been already on this journey for a long time. Let's go. Okay. We're yeah, off to see the wizard, wizard, the wonderful the wizard of us. <laughs> the Tin Man's revealing his heart and more. <laughs> Oh, and you know, like all our friends on the path, on the yellow brick road and maybe on the path, we forget what we already have in abundance, don't we? So the tin man thinks he has no heart, thinks his source has given him no heart. And the truth is the tin man proves himself over and over again throughout the journey that he is sensitive and compassionate and kind and loving. Maybe most of all, of all the friends, he sort of leads the way in these different gifts of the heart. And I don't know if everybody can see them, but every week I want to make sure that you can see my ruby slippers. <laughs> oh, I still see people craning, so. There you go. <laughs> And why that's important is not only because they're fun, but because they represent our capacities. And so today we're talking about tapping the heart's capacity, tapping our own capacity for, to remember, for one thing, that we have all the love we could ever need, all the heart we could ever need, and to then experience it, explore it, express it, open things up. So the Tin Man's a little bit like my father. My father was a very loving, gentle soul. He was somebody that people just liked to be around. He was very positive. But he also was somebody who hid his sensitivity. 
He grew up in the era of boys don't cry. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> yeah, so there was a lot of suppression of, of feeling, you know, and sometimes his anger would come out sideways, you know. But otherwise, it was, you know, I think I saw him cry, well, I know I did, I saw him cry twice in my entire life, once when his father died and once when his favorite sister was declining from cancer. And it was painful for him to express those feelings. It was embarrassing for him to express those feelings. And so when we tap the heart's capacity, we recognize that there are natural expressions, elixirs of love that get things moving, tears, emotion, feeling is one of them. When we hold back that dam, what happens? We sort of rust in place, right? And then we need someone to come along or something to come from within that gives us that elixir of love. And when that happens, then the movement allows spirit to move once again through us, divine love to break through our hearts once again. Because not only are we sourced by the love, but we then are the source for the love in the world. So wherever that jam occurs or that rusting into place occurs, those patterns that get us stuck, we are holding back the love that the world is hungry for or holding back the love our body needs or the kindness that our body is asking for. So the heart is known as the second brain. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it has this ganglionic center of nerves and and not only is it a second brain because of all that it does sort of automatic th automatically throughout the body and the neurological connections, but it is actually the first system that develops in the human embryo. So when we're about an inch long and eight weeks, we have a, the full system of heart and circulation in place. Isn't that amazing? So the very first thing First thing, probably, therefore, most important thing, right, that develops within us is this heart. And I don't know if you've ever heard about um, organ donors and when they get, have given a heart, that the new person receives this heart and then they find that they remember things and have preferences and desires that they never had before. Anybody ever hear those stories? Yeah, it's a common thing. And so what it tells us, obviously, is that the heart itself, even the organ itself, carries a consciousness with it. It takes with it, in the cells of the heart itself, the love, the memories, the experiences, the preferences, and the desires of the original person who had that heart. I think that's just incredible. And it just tells us about the wisdom that the heart holds, this idea of the second brain, or maybe it's the first brain. <laughs> maybe it's the primary brain, since love is such a primary, not just emotion, but spiritual quality. Charles Fillmore in our 12 Powers, Charles Fillmore is a co-founder of Unity along with his wife Myrtle, and he, put the, the, he located the, 12th, or the, the power of love at the back of the heart, and so I like to think of it as sort of the depths of the heart. In the depths of the heart, we tap the, the full power of the divine love, we, the, the full energy of that, the full possibility of that. So it's not so much that the tin man is missing a heart, of course. We know he's not missing a heart as none of us are. But what he's missing is a recognition of the capacities of, it, of his heart, the possibilities for his heart. He's sort of gotten rusted into an old pattern or position. Anybody relate to that? <laughs> <laughs> and so there we are, you know, in the, in the midst of chopping something down or doing something that we're stuck. And then whatever it is that we need eventually comes along. And a recognition within us, a song, if you will, our soul song comes forth. And how is it that the Tin Man can desire so deeply for something without a heart? Not possible, right? So wherever you might find yourself saying, I'm not loved or I'm not lovable, stop right there and recognize you're in an old rusty pattern that has no truth to it whatsoever. And all that needs to come forth is the elixir of spirit's love to open things up, to move things again, to break forth that dam that has been holding back 
all that goodness that you haven't been experiencing or sharing with the world. Now, for most of us, it's not a whole thing. It's not a we're closed or we're open. Generally, we're like sort of somewhere in the middle, right? <laughs> and so there's spaces where the love leaks out, whether we're, we're recognizing it or not, and places where it gushes forth. It's the places where things, there's just maybe some sticks or debris in the way that we want to pay attention to. It's the places that we may not be aware that we have some blockages. What are those blockages? It could be anything, fear and uncertainty, you know, uh, conflict, judgment, criticism, all that stuff gets stuck somewhere in there. And so it's a recognition of it that allows it to break through. So today we're talking about some key kind of spiritual food for the heart, some key ways in which we feed the heart and allow that elixir to move things and open things back up. One of the ways is through, you know, if we look at Dorothy herself, she again represents for us what's needed. Dorothy is an adolescent. So she's on that very important cusp of childhood and adulthood. She's got both some of the wisdom of a, of a woman, an adult woman, and childlike innocence. And it's the innocence that I want to talk about for a moment that is so key for us. This is food for the heart like nothing else. Because consider it, when you watch a puppy or a kitten or a child, what do you see but pure love, right? Pure joy, play, innocence. There are no heavy thoughts there about what's happening in the world or what I have to do on Monday morning or any of that, right? It's the moment, and the moment is fabulous generally. And so there is that sense of ease and, and innocence, and, and that childlike innocence is key. Isn't it fascinating that Dorothy meets three older men as her friends on the trip to Emerald City? You know they are the same as the three farmhands from Kansas that she was friends with. But isn't it interesting? Now, if you saw an adolescent woman hanging out with three older men <laughs> in our world, right, we would kind of wonder. Hmm, it's a little suspect. I wonder what's going on, right? Would your mind just automatically go to, how cool that they're all friends? I mean, maybe it would. But it'd be from that place that we would be tapping the innocence because their friendships are full of respect and love and kindness for each other and helping each other, collaboration and cooperation. It reminds me of when I was about six years old, and even though I had kids my own age that were friends, my best friends were two older men in the neighborhood. Mr. Wilson, no joke, next door. <laughs> I loved Mr. Wilson. I have no idea what we talked about, but we would talk for hours, and Mrs. Wilson would come out and bring us lemonade and snacks, and she'd go back in, and we just hung out on the back patio. And I guess I told him things about that happened at our house. I'm not sure. My parents once in a while would hear about it. <laughs> How my dad got, or my mom got my dad to stop snoring and other secret family secrets like these. But our, our relationship was truly just beautiful and innocent. And it was like a grandfather, an adopted grandfather and granddaughter, you know? And I loved Mr. Wilson so much. I remember once laying in bed and hearing a siren, and I started to cry because I thought something had happened to Mr. Wilson. Because my heart was so connected to him, and he was just my next door neighbor. But you know, I wonder, you know, in today's world, would my parents have let their six-year-old daughter go next door all the time to Mr. Wilson's, or down the street, the, the guy they didn't really even know, Mr. Van Dusen was like the great-grandfather of that household, and he always wore the big straw hat, and he'd let me in through the gate, and we'd hang out and go around his garden, and he'd show me what he was growing. And these were my friends. <laughs> and Dorothy, similarly, has made friends, the scarecrow, the tin man, the lion, three older men. And it breaks my heart to think that when we think of them being friends, I bet almost all of us go in our minds to, huh, something's not right there. And why? Where have we gone wrong? What has happened to our innocence? What have we lost? So much, right? There's the tin man chopping down the rainforest. And he rusts in place, thank God. <laughs> so there can be a moment to regroup, 
to remember, what are we doing? What have we done? We haven't missed, we don't miss a heart. We're not missing a heart or divine love or all the love and innocence we could possibly need. We've just forgotten. We've lost it. We've lost track. Somewhere along the way, we lost track. And one of the great ways we can bring it back is to bring in that innocence again. And we can do it. Even if you've been living a long time and you've got a different perspective of the world, you can shift that perspective. And I'm not talking about shifting into a Pollyanna space. I'm talking about shifting into the eyes of a child, like Jesus said, who enters the kingdom but somebody who has become like a child. It's not being childish, but childlike, quite a difference. And in a childlike way, we open up the heart, we stop putting all that stuff on it that protects it. And we allow ourselves to go into that space of full presence of God that is love, that is the palpability of love, that is that kind of feeling that you can, you can almost touch it. It's so real. You know that feeling, right? Those moments when you feel so connected to someone else or something else and so fully in the present moment. You're like a child for the first time discovering the world with a kind of awe and wonder. And you're meeting people along the way and you don't know not to talk to strangers because nobody's a stranger. We're all neighbors. We're all friends. We're all in it together. And when we can remember from those places, we bring back a little bit more of the innocence and we see each other through those eyes. We transform the world. That's who Dorothy is, skipping along, you know, finding her friends and always with just an open heart. How can I help you? Oh, you need to be oiled. Let me oil you back to life. And by the way, come with me. There's never a hesitation of, I'm not so sure about this guy. I don't know him yet. It's just that kind of open-hearted space. And so we can bring that with the wisdom that we have as, as elders and adults. We still have that. It's not we throw that out, but they integrate with one another, and we truly, with that, can change the world. And then there's nothing to be changed, really. Because when we see with the absolute eyes, we see it is all love. It is all innocence. It is all pure. It's just when we look with the relative. You know, we come into this world in oneness. We come into the world knowing oneness with spirit. We come in being from that source, from that pure love, and still fully knowing ourselves and remembering ourselves as that. And we come then into a world where everything is sort of, if you will, two-ness, duality contrast, which is also beautiful and challenging as heck, wouldn't you say? <laughs> but that's our whole journey as human divine beings. Our whole journey is about dealing with the duality of life and bringing it back to oneness, bringing it back to oneness. It's that yin-yang, you know? It's seeing the opposites and seeing the beauty of the opposites, the male and the female and the female and the male and how that makes us whole, the masculine, the feminine, the black and the white and the brown, all of those ways of expression, the gender expression spectrum, all of that, the emotional spectrum, it's all meant to be together because we are both human and divine, come into this world to bring the oneness into the world of duality see the oneness, and allow it to flow through us. So then we relate to each other, not through our differences, but through our similarities, Christ to Christ, divine to divine, heart to heart, soul to soul, with that elixir of love given freely. So it's that innocence, you know, finding that child within you, if you've ever done that, that kind of work, and it's, it's not, there's no mystery to it, you just drop in in your meditation and see if you can get an image or a feeling of the child in you. And a, a child usually will show, your child, yourself as a child, will usually show up in, at some age that is key to maybe where you left the relationship off or maybe where there's some healing that's needed or maybe where they, that child wants to communicate something to you. And so you can see, what does my child need? Maybe they need a hug. Maybe there needs to be just some communication and attention. What do children want? Love and attention, right? 
and play and fun. So that's usually what a child wants, your child from within you wants, is some love and attention and recognition and some play. Let that child lead the way. Give yourself a couple of hours to go on a play date with your child. Let the child lead the way. Oh, what fun you will have, I promise you. <laughs> and you'll be in the presence, you know? You'll be in the pre full presence of God, the present moment. It slows everything down. You start to recognize things. You'll start to see things on the ground that you hadn't seen before, noticing colors and combinations and things that you might not, that you might have passed by as your mind was busy on what next, and instead dropping into that. So as we, we bring forth that innocence from within us, we, we tap another capacity of our heart. We give food to the heart, spiritual food to the heart, that childlike innocence. Gratitude is another kind of love that we give to the heart, you know, kind of food that we give to the heart. And that happens when we're in that presence. We tend to become grateful for the things that we're noticing or experiencing directly. I remember being on a meditation retreat, and it was a 10-day retreat. And after, I don't know, six or seven days in, I just was so, like, wanting stimulation, you know? <laughs> And I remember seeing this guy in a red shirt, like all the way across the campus. And I was like, oh, red, you know, <laughs> like a hummingbird, you know, just like right there, you know, little wings flapping. I was so excited. <laughs> but it's when we have slowed down, right, brought in that mindfulness and that meditation that we are so present to the beauty of the world and feel so filled and grateful. And just that can feed us so much. Wherever your heart is, Jesus said, there will your treasure be also. And so and originally it was said, wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There, it can be flipped either way, but I, I like the heart and the treasure because it is where our treasure is. This is where the treasure of empathy comes in. When we give each other and ourselves empathy, this is one of the great ways that we express this elixir of love into the world, that we source love into the world. So it starts at home. It starts close to home. You know, we can ch talk about changing the world, and we can also talk about what's close to home. Where do we get started? So I was thinking about last week, um, I was feeling kind of disconnected from Brenly. I'd been away for a while, and she was kind of wrapped up in some things when I got home. And I was sitting there and thinking about how I really wanted to hug and connect and see her smile and feel her warmth. And I was kind of silently stewing about it, you know, just sort of like, you know, she should be reading my mind. Anybody else ever do that? <laughs> my partner should know what I need and should deliver it when we need it, right? And when I caught myself, I realized, ah, how will we ever expect you know, to be able to communicate with anybody out there in the world that we've not communicated with yet, who might even have a different viewpoint than us, if we're not even, like, with our most intimate people expressing what we want and need and feel. And so, ah, the light bulb went off. Hey, honey, I miss you. Can we just have a moment of connection? Of course. <laughs> So it's that kind of, you know, thing that we have to nip it in the bud, notice, bring the conscious awareness to it so that that empathy can flow into our hearts and feed our hearts so that we're strong for the world. I think about, you know, when I'm thinking about that innocence, I... That, that young woman who was um, interviewed by a reporter, and, you know, this is a testimony to our times. I don't even remember what school shooting. It was like the last, one of the last ones. I don't even remember where it was, and I tried to find it online. I couldn't find it because it's out of the news loop, you know? It's out of the news loop. It's sort of out of our minds, right, until it's back in. And this young woman was asked, like many reporters ask, you know, I bet she never thought this was going to happen here, and how are you feeling about it? And she said, no, I figured sooner or later it'd happen here too. You know, a teenage girl <laughs> in our world has already become jaded <laughs> by these kinds of ways where we've lost our way. But the thing is, it's not that complicated to get back on track. 
We make it complicated. We think it's about moving enormous systems and changing big policies, and that's part of it. But that's not what we in of, of ourselves need to do in this moment today. <laughs> but what can we do in this moment today? We can feel that bit of heartbreak, and then we can say, more innocence is going to pour from my, the child within me into the world so that I can flood this world once again with some of that innocence that I don't want taken from our children too soon. Or maybe ever. <laughs> Why don't we dream big while we're dreaming, right? <laughs> so it's this dance of empathy and gratitude and, and childlike innocence that feeds the heart and that brings forth the love that the world needs to be healed and is perfect and whole just as it is. <laughs> Can you see through both of those eyes, seeing it as perfect and whole, just as it is, as God would see it, and just as we see it through our own divine eyes? You know, you hear the activists who say, I'm outraged, and I hear that, and then I think, and now what? <laughs> because the outrage in and of itself isn't going to solve the issue. But if you take that raw energy of outrage and open it up for what it is, deep, caring love, right? And in that deep, caring love, there is compassion, there is passion. That we can work with. That people can hear. That can change lives, can connect heart to heart. The outrage, probably going to send people flying. <laughs> so it's people like us that are prayerful people that have been on the journey for a long time, that, that have a sense of how to tap that presence and that divine love, that can help the ones who are out on the front lines pushing for policy changes and feeling outraged, that, that, that we can work together. And it's those people that are on the front lines of making change and that are often even risking their own lives to do so that can teach us to get up off the cushion, out of the prayer room, and out into the world to serve, to give, to experience and express this love. This moving together, that heals. That is the elixir that is needed to get us out of our rusty places. So did you ever see the Tin Man dance? I didn't sign, sign Mike up for dancing today, but <laughs> you got to watch The Wizard of Oz, the full thing, and watch how the Tin Man dances once he's oiled. You know, that's, that's the kind of movement and energy and animation of spirit that we're talking about. And it's love that will do that. It's the discovery and the rediscovery and the remembering. You know, if you think of PG&E powering your house, think of CG&E powering your heart. Childlike innocence, gratitude, and empathy. And allow that to be your mantra and your work and your expression. And if we all do that together, you know, what a world we change. Just every moment of every day. Just once a day, even, we just make one of those our aim, our goal. We give ourselves a, a practice in one of those, childlike innocence, a gratitude proactive practice in some way, or empathy for ourselves. How do you speak to yourself? What is the tone of voice when you are talking to yourself? What is the tone and the words with which you speak to yourself? Check that out. Because if it's not kind and loving and instead is critical and harsh, you're not doing anybody any good. And so shift the voice, the inner voice, to one of empathy and kindness. Speak to yourself like you'd want your best friend or your most beloved to speak to you. Speak to yourself how you'd want your child to speak to you when they're in that most innocent space or how your dog loves you. Love yourself like your dog loves you, you know? <laughs> it makes for a whole new world. So let's know this together. Let's know that we've come to be the very essence of divine love, and it is that that heals the world, that our heart is overflowing, and let's affirm it together. My heart overflows with divine love and heals the world. So let's take a moment just to really get heart-centered to say this once more together. 
just breathe into your heart and really activate the power, knowing that you yourself are bringing the very power of love to the world. And let's say that one more time. My heart overflows with divine love and heals the world. So it is. Thank <laughs> you.